Hello and welcome to another edition of Digital Flotsam. I'm P.W. Fenton. In the episode of Digital Flotsam called Brain Dead, I talked about the stupidity of young boys and their inability to recognize consequence. The implication there was that they were programmed to do stupid things. But I was recently thinking about my earliest days on Earth and I noticed something far more sinister than mere stupidity. It's kind of amazing I'm still here. In that original Brain Dead episode, I said, Nowhere in the capacity of a young boy is there the ability to put two steps in a process in their obvious order. Like, if I jump off the roof of the garage with this towel tied around my neck so as to represent Superman's cape, I will get hurt. Well, that wasn't creative writing. That was something I actually did. I knew I couldn't actually fly. I just wanted to experience the feeling of flying. However briefly, as I plummeted to Earth. I didn't injure myself in any way, but I did experience some considerable pain when my mother just happened to step out the back door to get the laundry off the clothesline right at the moment I leapt off the roof. Not only was I caught jumping, I was caught landing and rolling on the ground with a freshly laundered towel that I had earlier snatched from the clothesline. My backside was red for hours. But that's not really the best example of what I'm talking about here. In those days, it was as though I had a death wish. Some of these things my parents never even knew. Some of them they were painfully aware of. For example, one day my mom gave me some money and sent me to Mazalowski's, the local grocery store, which was maybe three blocks away. She told me she wanted a loaf of bread, a bottle of milk, and a quarter pound of American cheese. I left the house reciting the order so that I would remember it. A loaf for bread, a bottle of milk, and a quarter pound of American cheese. A loaf for bread, a bottle of milk, and a quarter pound of American cheese. A loaf for bread, a bottle of milk, and a quarter pound of American cheese. As I walked along Cannon Avenue, concentrating deeply on reciting the order, I never noticed the huge truck barreling too fast down the avenue. At the last possible moment, I heard its horn blast, and I dashed toward the opposite curb just in time to feel its big bumper only brush my back. I easily could have died just 75 feet from my house. I never told my parents about that experience. On top of that, by the time I got to the store, my recitation had turned into something totally incomprehensible. I had no idea what my mother asked me to get at the store. I had to go back home and get my mother to write it down for Mr. Mazalowski. I lived in a classic American small town, a town called Travis. In the 1800s, it was called Linoleumville. To this day, it has a small town feel, even though it's technically part of New York City. It had a fabulous 4th of July parade every year that wound all through the residential neighborhoods and right past the front of my house. All the neighborhood kids would decorate their bicycles with flags and various forms of red, white, and blue bunting and ride in the tail end of the parade. A prize would be given to the best decorated bike. I can remember, when I was too young to ride a decorated bike, sitting in a mulberry tree in my front yard watching the parade go by. I remember one year the parade had a real Sherman tank in it, and when it went by my house it shook the ground so much it made the white mulberries fall out of the tree. 
We had one grocery store, one hardware store, one soda shop, one drug store, a volunteer fire department, one of the oldest elementary schools in the New York public school system, PS26, and two churches, a Protestant, more exactly Methodist church, and a tiny Catholic church. Now, despite being baptized in a Catholic church as an infant, I knew nothing about the Catholic religion. My family went to that Methodist church. All I knew about Catholics was that when I was walking home from elementary school, the Catholic kids all had to make the sign of the cross when they walked past their church. Not wanting to do anything wrong, uh, I was doing it too for a while, but one day uh, when I mentioned it to my parents, they both said that since I was a Methodist, I didn't have to do that. Now, I felt really conflicted. I mean, I had my parents on one side saying I didn't have to do it, but on the other side, I had the fear of God. So my little kid mind created a solution. On my walk home from school each day, I would walk on the opposite side of the street from the Catholic Church, and when I got to where it was, I would run as fast as I could right past it, so as not to anger God with my lack of respect. I would stop, get into a stance like I was ready to sprint, and take off. This seemed to work. As long as I ran past the Catholic Church, I could be square with both God and my parents. Well, one day, as I was preparing to make my Catholic Church death dash, a schoolmate ran right beside me, grabbing my hat as he went past, and tossed it over a picket fence into somebody's front yard. He kept running, and I stood there, still in my race starter stance, totally shocked by this turn of events. Other school kids were chuckling in the background. I wanted to just disappear, but the thought of going home without my hat was worse than being struck dead by the Catholic God for not making the sign of the cross. The yard was directly across the street from the Catholic Church. This was going to be dangerous. I approached from the side. I made an unsteady effort to climb over the picket fence. I managed to climb up, stand on top of the fence. Next step was to simply leap to the ground, grab my hat, and then scramble out before the homeowner even knew I was there. But instead, I slipped. I dropped straight down, left leg outside of the fence, right leg inside of the fence. Wham! The pain was excruciating. But one, loads of familiar schoolmates were looking at me, and two, the homeowner could come running out the door at any second, so I just rolled off the fence, grabbed my hat, and scrambled back to the other side. As I continued my walk home, I did not acknowledge the pain to anyone, but it was pretty clear I was limping. It was excruciating. When I walked into the house, my mother could see I was in distress. I told her the story about what happened across from the Catholic Church, and she asked me to pull down my pants and show her. I don't know what it is, but even a six-year-old boy is reluctant to pull down his pants. But she insisted, and I complied. What I saw nearly caused me to faint. I was covered with blood and had nearly performed the world's first sex change operation. I see danger ahead. Oh, yeah. I see danger ahead. Oh, yeah. had an incredible first grade teacher. Her name was Mrs. Clara Taylor. Mrs. Taylor looked like Cora the coffee lady from the old Maxwell House coffee commercials. For foreign listeners, that's the actress that played the bad witch in The Wizard of Oz. 
I loved Mrs. Taylor. One day, the school held a track meet in a nearby park. Being a kid that ran virtually everywhere I went, I fully expected to win the 100-yard dash. But another boy made us all look like we were standing still. I never even got to touch the finish line ribbon because he just ran off with it trailing behind him. Mrs. Taylor, noticing my disappointment, gave me some great advice. You've got to run on your toes. Don't put your whole foot on the ground. Run on your toes. Well, the very next week, I put her advice to the test. During recess, I challenged the guy who had beat us all to a schoolyard match race. Me against him. From the lunchroom door to the back fence. The signal was given, and we took off. I tilted my whole body forward with my head looking down at the ground so I could maximize the running on my toes that Mrs. Taylor taught me. I took off running with all my might. I hadn't run for very long at all before I felt an impact that sent a weird sound through my head and put a metallic taste in my mouth. As I crumbled to the ground, I remember seeing the red bricks on the side of the utility shed that I had just ran headfirst into. The next thing I remember, I'm in the principal's office. I have a lump on my head the size of a tennis ball, and the principal is calling my mother. I beg to be left alone. The idea of my mother having to come to the school because her son ran headfirst into a brick wall was worse to me than the idea of dying from the same cause. But again, I survived. I had a buddy who lived down the street from me. In fact, his house was the farthest I was allowed to go. His family owned a big old house, and there was a large piece of untended land next to the house. Out in this big open field was the rusted hulk of an old oil tanker truck. How it got out there in the middle of open land... I still have no idea, but its rotting hulk was a playground for two young boys. We lived very near a major oil import terminal, and I guess that's why it got there. How was another story? Well, of course, we climbed onto this old hulk, opened the hatch on top of the tank, and discovered a very cool cavern, which would make a great clubhouse. It reeked of petroleum which we, of course, found very attractive, and it had a hatch which we could open from the outside. If it ever closed on us while we were inside, we would never have a way to open it. We actually took turns sitting inside while the other closed the hatch from the outside just to experience the total darkness. We played in it every day, the fumes no doubt getting us stoned, and we gathered the wild rhubarb that grew in the sandy ground around it to bring into our hideout for nourishment. My buddy knew it was called rhubarb, but that was it. We chewed its stringy stalks raw, right out of the ground, because it was so deliciously sour. To this day, many years later, it's no trouble at all to summon up that taste from my memory. Of course, while we sat in the poisonous fumes, in danger of being trapped inside a vessel our parents didn't even know existed, we dined on wild rhubarb oblivious to the fact that the leaves are highly poisonous. I guess they didn't taste good, or I wouldn't be talking to you now. I've saved the best for last. Not only the best for last, but the first for last. When I made my very first and perhaps best attempt to end my short life, I was only five years old. 
One day, when my mom was getting in some quality time in the bathroom, I decided that it was the ideal time to perform a close inspection of those strange, slotted things that were on the lower part of the wall in the living room. I didn't really have any idea what an electrical socket was, or what it was actually for. All I knew was that any time I showed any interest in them, my parents would always chase me away. Well, with my dad at work and my mom reading on the throne, uh, this appeared to be a great time to get a good look at these things. I got down on my hands and knees and made a close and detailed visual inspection. There, there was nothing I could get from looking at these things that gave me any indication of what they did. The secret had to lie inside of those two slots. Well, my fingers were too big to probe the narrow slots, so I decided I needed some kind of tool to probe their secrets. I went into the kitchen, and I found a small butter knife that looked perfect for the job. I walked past the bathroom and back into the living room and got back down on my knees with my new probing tool. It looked as though it would fit perfectly in the slots, but the fact that I was standing on my knees and not very well coordinated, I was having trouble getting the little tool aimed into the tiny slot, so I decided to steady myself by holding onto the large iron hot water radiator standing just to the left of the socket. So with my left hand holding onto the plumbing, I leaned over and carefully slipped my little butter knife into one of the slots. I instantly felt a sudden and paralyzing pain. 120 volts was coursing from my little right hand holding the butter knife to the hot water pipes I was holding with my little left hand. I remember the feeling vividly to this day. I was frozen like a statue. I couldn't call out. I couldn't open my hands to let go. In fact, I couldn't move a single muscle. To this day, I have no idea what made my mother drop her book and run from the bathroom with her bloomers dangling from one of her ankles. Perhaps she subconsciously noticed me walk by the bathroom with a butter knife and then the light flickered or something in the bathroom and her mind made the connection. I don't know and I never will, but something made her run out of the bathroom and into the living room and something gave her the good sense to kick my right hand, knocking it and the knife away from the electrical socket. And because of that, you are hearing me tell this story. One more page in that book, and there would not be a podcast called Digital Flotsam. I think we've reached a point in human evolution where survival of the fittest no longer has any bearing. I think even as far back in ancient times as when I was born, survival became a matter of pure, unadulterated, dumb luck. I tried way too hard to risk my life to actually deserve survival. You've been listening to Digital Flotsam and I'm P.W. Fenton. I apologize for the long absence Please stay subscribed. Good night, Mrs. Calabash, wherever you are. And Peter holded the microphone.